Hey everyone, welcome back. This is the second part in this workshop, which is in association with Muse by Lemesca and AccuColor by BenQ. And if you want to see the original part of this, where we did the shoot, there'll be a link somewhere below. But for now, we're focusing on post-production and post-production kind of starts in this room here. So this is my editing suite. Last time I was in the studio and today we're very much at a desk. So I'm going to show you my entire color workflow and then how to edit the images. And I think you should all have the raw files by now as well so you can have a play. I'll explain why I shot what I did and the way I did it and just generally how, how it's best to practice your editing workflow. So things start off with the monitor really. The monitor is one of the most important things. And it's not just having a good monitor, it's having a good monitor in the right place. So currently we've got the house lights on, which is what's lighting the scene. This is not how we edit. I tend to work in a very dimly lit room. Now, this is a, a BenQ monitor and it's got the lens hood, or it's not really a lens hood, it's a monitor hood, isn't it? But it's got the monitor hood up above it here. And this just stops excess light from the window behind me spilling into my screen, reducing glare. And it just makes it a little bit easier for my eyes to work as well. So there's more contrast. It's a dark background behind it, all very important things. In the past, I've worked with windows to the side, bright white rooms, and it's it's just not great for your eyes, and also it's not great for you to be able to see correct colors. Now, obviously, I'm fortunate enough to have my own editing suite, so I don't have to negotiate with anybody how we're decorating the room, but sometimes it can be something as simple as when I used to work at home, I'd get a coach rack and put a jacket behind me just to stop any like, light bouncing off back walls and to keep things as, as like neutral as possible for me. Editing wise, last time we talked, I showed you this bit of kit here, which is the little color chart. And this has made sure we've got the correct colors in camera, but there's an extra step to this. And this is calibrating our monitor. So monitors claim, claim to be accurate, claim to be calibrated or self calibrating. This is kind of, they do, but, but not as well as we could do. So we have this fancy gizmo here. This is called the Calibrite Color Checker Display Pro. And this will actually calibrate your monitor consistently. And it's what we use for pretty much every job. Now I work with a lot of photographers one-to-one -one, and one of the big things we have is they'll send me an image and I'll go, it's green. And they'll be like, no, it's pink. I'm like, no, 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 it's got, a, it's got a green cast. This here makes sure that if you've done it and I've done it, we're both looking at the same thing or as close as possible given our environment. The other big mistake people have is their monitors are too bright. And when I say too bright, I often open someone's laptop up and like my face is sort of getting a suntan from it. And this here makes sure that you can set the parameters to your brightness. We normally have it at 100, and I think it's called candelier, which is candles, um, to make sure that when you're looking at it, not only using a histogram to get the right brightness, but you can actually go, yes, this looks like it will look in print, which for the majority of us, for most of our careers, is where our work will end up, bar Instagram. Now, in terms of calibrating, I will be sat here looking at my monitor. And if I look at this monitor every day for the next six months, it will look the same to me. So every time I do a big job, we calibrate freshly with this because you won't notice that you've gone out of calibration. You don't look at it one day and go, that looks different. It's a gradual thing. Normally, you'd go for every 100 hours, but I like to do a fresh calibration on every single job. Um, and prior to this, we calculated that every 100 hours is probably like a week in the studio. So at least once a week, we do a fresh calibration. It takes a while. I'm not going to show you it on the screen. I am going to show you the interface, though, um, because, of course, if I calibrate my monitor here and show you the difference, you won't be seeing my calibrated monitor that I'm seeing because you're on your uncalibrated monitor, which is a mouthful to get through. But the way that this works is it goes through the brightness, the contrast, the white points, the black points, and make sure that are displaying correctly. It doesn't take long. It's really self-explanatory. You go through these little steps at the bottom and you end up with a perfectly calibrated monitor for the monitor you have. If you try and calibrate your TV from the 1970s, it won't be as good, but any modern BenQ monitor, you'll get a really good image out of. So what that means is that now this monitor here is showing me correct colors, which kind of loops back to the last part of the, the workshop where we photographed this. This part of the equation tells my camera these are the correct colors. So at this point, as you'll see in the edit, we know the camera's correct, and I now also know, because I calibrated my monitor before doing this, that what I'm seeing is correct. So I should, under the right light, be able to hold up this next to my calibrated photograph and go, yes, 
they look the same. Of course, the monitor's backlit and this is not, and I'm on the video side. But if I do a bit of clinking, there we go. If we hold this up next to my image and we have it up on the screen, it'll show us exactly the same colors. And this is important. Like I said, when we're editing, if we're guessing what might be right, we're probably going to be wrong. If you look at this under 10 different light sources, it'll look 10 different ways of difference. So we've got our monitor correct. We've got a file in our camera that is correct to this. So now we're going to jump into my editing software and I'm going to show you how we pull the whole thing together. Now, I'm using Capture One, which currently has the spinning wheel of doom going on, which is never a good sign. Let's just close some extra bits down. We'll quit that. We have to do a quick restart, but I'll tell you why I'm using Capture One in the meantime. So Capture One is the software I use to edit. Most people use Lightroom. Um, it's the most accessible, it's the most affordable. Everything within Capture One works pretty much in terms of what you see in sliders, the same as it does in Lightroom. There's not really a great difference in terms of what you see. So if I do it here, you can kind of repeat it in Lightroom. The big difference is Lightroom looks a little bit more user-friendly and Capture One looks like it was developed in the depths of some IT department. Um, but the reason why I use Capture One is because it is the industry standard in professional photography. It is what everybody uses in the commercial world. Uh, whenever a Digitech, the person who looks after your images turns up, they have Capture One and the, the Phase One cameras they only work with Capture One. So that's kind of where Capture One comes in. But you can do it in any software. So here we have our picture of sardines. I'm just going to we'll fully reset it. This is straight out of camera. And then here we have our little color chart. So I'm going to do this one with the full process. And the second one, I've cheated and already done it beforehand. But I'll show you exactly what we do here. So at the moment, I am seeing because my monitor is calibrated, my eyes are seeing exactly what the computer is showing. So if I looked at this in five different calibrated identical monitors, it all looked the same. The problem is at this stage, my camera is not seeing correctly. So I'm going to come in here, grab my little white balance tool, and this will be the same on the uh, Adobe Lightroom. Take a, a white balance. Now this is the only tricky bit. You have to go to linear response. You come into this bit here, the ICC profile, which is what we're going to change. And we're going to go to no color correction. And what you end up with is the most bland and mundane image you've ever seen. But don't panic. This is part of the process. We're then going to sneak up here to export. And we're going to export it as a 16-bit TIFF. So we'll export that. And out goes our image. So I am now going to come into the software that comes for free with the color checker. I'm going to get our lovely TIFF file. Let's just go to my desktop. Uh, live. Here it is. I'm going to drag this into here. There we go. And then all we need to do is drag these squares so they're actually covering the right area. It does a pretty good job of finding it because I shot this at such a bizarre angle. We're just going to tweak it a little bit. I like to get them as centered as possible just so we're definitely getting a good a good mix in there. Let's just pull this brown one down a little bit. So at this stage here, we've got this neutral profile of an image. And this software is about to tell my camera what these colors should be. So when you look on the screen at the moment, they look quite flat. And this stage here is going right. Here's what you should be seeing. Let's tell the camera to see that. So that's what this stage is. It's very important. Unless you happen to be a wizard at remembering colors, this is the, the best way to do it. So we're going to go to Calibrate, and we'll call this Sardines Test. There we go. We'll save that profile. So there's a little bit of wizardry here. It saves it into your Profiles folder, which is predetermined by your software. You don't need to do any like magic at this stage. Let's give that a couple of moments to pull through. And then all we do after this is we close the software down and reopen it so it finds the profile. Thankfully for you, I've done that in advance and I've already made the profile, but we'll just quickly put it in. But you do have to close it, shut Capture One down fully, and then reopen it for it to be able to find the correct ICC profile. Okay, it's just doing its magic. Oh, there we go, it's successful. Okay. So we'll pretend I've closed it down. We'll now come into here where it says ICC profiles. 
and then we're going to other, and then we'll click on my sardine. Now, if we just do the before and after, that's what the camera thought it saw. That's what it actually saw. Now, this is where things are hard to explain. So I'm showing you the difference on here, but you're looking probably on an uncalibrated monitor. Now I know what I'm seeing is correct. So I've just calibrated, but I think as a worst case scenario, this is definitely the first port of call. At least if you go, if I don't touch the colors, at least they're right, even if they look wrong, but I like to look at the right colors as well. So we've got our right colors in here. So what I'm going to do now is copy this. And I think it's called sync in Adobe Lightroom. And then I'm going to apply it here. There we go. So now we've got the correct colors on our file. Let me put my color dropper back before I break them. Now I have a set way of working in like post-production in general. The first thing I like to do is crop it just so I'm not doing anything to parts of the file that actually don't matter. I don't want to be taken into consideration something which I'm not going to see in my final image. Um, and I'm a big fan of cropping. After years of thinking cropping's cheating, I, I just don't. It's just nice to crop. There we go. So we start off over here in our exposure tab and I like to come through. We get the clarity tab open. We'll get the exposure, high dynamic range and uh, levels. I don't like using curve because I find them a little bit too sensitive, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, whereas this is just nice and easy. So you see this here, this is our red channel, which is predominantly these pinks and fuchsias. I'm going to pull this bottom line all the way along to it until it just about touches it and then go a little bit too far because I like my images on the side of overexposure and radioactive colors. Um, this is personal taste. There's no right or wrong at this stage. This will have some effect on the colors, um, but mostly in terms of contrast. So there we go. That's kind of hard. I mean, we could go all the way here, but then it's too punchy in the sardine. So let's just go by eye. And now this is another important part of why you should calibrate your monitor. When I'm looking at this black point here, I know exactly what it's actually looking like and the brightness is correct. And when I print it, assuming I get a good print, it will come out the same. So all very important stuff. The next thing I like to do before we change anything is look at clarity. Clarity is the one thing you'll use too much of. Um, so the what I like to do is go to 100 um, and then work my way backwards until I can't tell that I've gone too far. And this is kind of pixel by pixel contrast. Um, the higher resolution your camera is, for some reason, I'm sure there's a technical reason for this, the more clarity you can put in there. And then Capture One has different methods for putting clarity in, which I don't believe Lightroom did last time I checked, but I like punch um, because it's punchy. And you can see it brings up a whole load of texture here that we don't want. So it's gonna ease back a little bit. There we go. And then structure, just a smidge of that. Not looking too bad. Okay, so you can see now that this has adjusted these sliders here. So we're just gonna pull those in so they look. And I'm doing this all by eye. And the good thing about doing it by eye is I know it's right um, because we're calibrated, which is always a nice place to be. So like I said, I don't touch the curves. I sometimes, despite the fact that this here is dealing with the high dynamic range, I find that adjusting the highlights here to save them is just a bit easier. Um, so we do just pull those down a bit now and then. And we've got our white balance set and everything else. So now we're going to go into colors. And you might be thinking, why are you going into color, Scott? You've just perfectly corrected your colors on the color checker, which I have. But just because I can have perfectly correct colors doesn't mean I want them. Um, but starting as a, a solid base is always better than starting with whatever the camera pulls and trying to achieve something random. So starting from what it looks like and changing it is easier than starting from this and trying to change it. Um, and generally what I do here is go into the advanced section, and this is the HSL sliders in Lightroom, I believe. I think that's what they're called, HSL sliders. Um, and what we might do is just pick out this particular color here, and we might just play with the luminosity of it a little bit. Sometimes I'll play with the hue, probably not in this shot though, because I actually want the hue to be correct, but the luminosity for sure. We might even go as far as choosing particular darker areas and just increasing the saturation just a tiny bit. Um, but then coming into the, the fishes over here, and maybe just brightening them up just with that color, it looks nice. That little pop, there we go. And I do quite a lot in here. I, I often spend maybe 10, 15 minutes slowly 
adjusting the various colors in the shot. And this point here, and we're running through this one a bit quickly as we go into more detail in the next shots because it's a bit more interesting in post. I'll add sharpening. Now, sharpening is a tricky one because if you sharpen it too much, it looks like you've sharpened it too much. So I always think you want to sharpen an image to the point that you can't tell that it's been sharpened. Uh, and in order to do that, let's put that pipette back. In order to do that, what I like to start off with is I come into here, these, like, these little drop downs which I didn't know existed for ages, and we go down to Soft Image Sharpening 2. I don't know why, but this one usually starts at a pretty good place. Um, and now what we need to do is find a sharp edge because you see how we're getting a bit of haloing here? This will be a combination of two things, the clarity and the sharpening. Um, and we have a bit of halo suppression here that we can use. We can also pull our radius down and that is how big the pixel is, it sharpens. Look at this, I don't know if you can see that on your screens, but we've got this really big white band around the edge. I don't even remember in the early noughties when HDR suddenly became cool and everything looked like it had this monstrous halo effect. But as you reduce the radius, that goes away. Goes away. There's always a fine line between reducing it and just getting smooth smush. So at 0 0.8, I can see the white line. And all I do now is I go back one at a time. There we go. At 0 0.6, it's gone. And then if we increase the sharpening, of course, you start to see literal pixel by pixel sharpening and you just bring it down again until you don't know that you've done anything um, and i always think that that is the the aim in color grading and sort of sharpening of any image is do it so that you can't tell it's been done um, now something i do to all of my images but not usually at this stage it's normally after photoshop is that we start adding some grain in there because i quite like a little bit of soft grain uh, and I just use the built-in one. What we do is we just zoom into a sort of slightly out of focus area. And we just add that grain in. Now, if I was going full edit on the shot here, in post, obviously we'd tidy up the background, tidy up this a bit. We'd mask around the paper. We'd remove all the texture from the background and foreground and give it a very crisp and clean look. But that takes about an hour to do. It's very boring. You can do it quickly with some median blur, perhaps. Um, but it's not really an exciting thing to watch somebody do. So what we're going to do instead, in a very Blue Peter fashion, here's what I made earlier, is show you how to edit and tidy and retouch this shot here, because I think this is the more exciting shot. So I've already taken my colour checker from this shot, and let me show what it looked like originally. It was overexposed. It was kind of blown out, I think. I think even the black points are uh, struggling a little bit. Um, and then we've corrected it and got the correct ICC profile from the color checker. We pulled that all in and we've copied it over to here. And again, if I just show you the before and after, even on the can, yes, it's overexposed on the left, but you can see the actual yellow color selected by the camera compared to by the chart are two very different things. So all that this image has had so far, apart from the 0 0.1 adjustment that I made by mistake, is that the ICC profile has been added into the colors. It's called test because I called it test. We've got the linear response on it. Uh, we can change these to whatever you want, linears being the flattest. We can go to sort of like some more contrasty ones. I've always gone to linear response because it gives you the most detail visible to the eye. Not that the others lose the detail. It's still all there because it's a raw file, but it just allows you to see it all, I think, is, is how I see it anyway. Um, so again, we're going to crop it first. And this is a great example of why we crop it first. As I was pulling up the light thingy, it got really bright at the top where I held it for too long when I thought I'd finished the exposure and I hadn't. I'm not going to have all of that in frame, so I need to know which bits are in frame so I know exactly what I'm dealing with in post-production, because I don't want to start editing part of it that isn't actually in the shot. So that's where I want it. Bottom third, negative space here, because this is a typical advertising crop. Um, it gives a space for text and subtext. And we're just going to give that a quick OK. There we go. I'll do a quick straighten. And we're just going to go off the word Indian. So just at there, it's just at there we go. Never knowingly took a straight shot, but there we go. Super. So we've got the correct colors ish on the exposure. I'm going to go through the full grade and tidy up that I'd do for this sort of shot. So I've got some weird 
artifacts that were creeping in here. Definitely some sensor dust somewhere. Um, but yes, let's dive on in. So back to the original part here. The first one we're going to do is pull the highlights down. And we're looking at this ice specifically to see whether we lost the detail. We didn't, thankfully. That could have been embarrassing. Or whether we maintained the detail. So the ice has still got the detail in it. Um, so it's going to pull that highlight down for now. We're then going to look at the black on the Schweppes. Now, the problem with shooting anything like this is that the printing is not as sharp as the camera captures the image. Um, so you'll notice that the, the droplets, which are on the same plane of focus, are sharper than the text. It's because they never really print the text that well. I don't think they can print it that sharply. Um, so what we're going to do here is pull the shadows in just to try and add that little bit. There we go. So the black points come in just to add a little bit more contrast there, which I like. We're now going to go back to the punch in clarity. There we go. OK, so we've got a nice punchy shot that looks detailed. It's not gone. I mean, it's got haloing on it, but that's actually a, a catch light from the back. It's not an actual sharpening halo yet. Um, but we're getting there. We're getting there. We've got a problem up here in that this is clipping in the color channel. I'm going to see if we can retrieve that without masses of work um, and that we need something doing about the vibrancy of the background. So we're going to grab a brush, which is living up here. Scott, just got a question. Yep. Um, so Thomas has asked, how, how do you remove the texture? Can you talk through the process in Photoshop? Is it a simple job or is it something that requires ah, a little bit more? So removing the texture in Photoshop is quite a complicated job. Uh, well, no, no, it has the potential to be simple. If you're photographing a non-textured item like the can of Schweppes, you can do a median blur. Um, because the can's smooth and the background's smooth, it looks correct. But every single background replacement has to be taken on the merit of the item you photograph. If you've got a super textured steak and you suddenly have it on a completely textureless background, it looks really fake. So at which point we usually add in digital noise and then we add in matching grain structure to the background and the product to try and blend them in to have the same aesthetic. So it's simple in theory, um, and it's just a case of masking out the areas and then a median blur, but it can become very complicated, and sometimes we actually end up doing an entire background from scratch. So we'll literally cut the item out and then draw a new background in place, um, and it, it's incredibly time-consuming, and in all honesty, I often send it to a retoucher to do that because it takes so long and I can't sit still for long enough to actually do that sort of thing. I'll be uh, fidgeting around for ages. But medium blur is a good starting point. And it's always worth thinking about adding texture in the form of noise to that layer just so it doesn't look like you've cut it out and stuck it on a sort of CGI background. So I'm going to quickly brush a layer in here. Now I'm doing this with my mouse. I'd normally use my Wacom tablet for this. Uh, so it's going to brush in here. This is quite slapdash and just pull the white point down. And then the highlights. There we go. That's made a big difference. Now we still want the catch light in the middle. There needs to be a brightest point. Uh, a lot of people think that blowing something out is a bad thing. Um, I don't subscribe to that train of thought. I think blowing the wrong thing out is a bad thing. Um, but having this catch light here just gives the whole thing a bit of oomph. So we've done that one adjustment layer. Always label your layers. We'll call this one catch light. Uh, and this is kind of like Photoshop in a way nowadays. It, it, it's a very, let's do a new mask here. These are like layers now we're adding. And I believe that Lightroom has recently also added layers to their editing, So, which makes sense because Adobe run Photoshop. So we're going to call this one can. Um, and again, we're going to do a bit of a slapdash brush, draw a mask. And we're not going to get this bit here, but we're going to get the main body of the can. Just do a bigger brush because it's not very, it's not very easy with a the mouse. There we go. And it's mostly the center, so I'm feathering it off to the sides. There we go. And this redness here is just showing me what I've brushed. And all I want to do now is increase the shadows a little bit there. The highlights and the white point really affects the colors. You see that there? There we go. And I'm not sure how clear the actual uh, version you're seeing is via live stream. So if it looks like it's doing very little, I apologize. 
Uh, let's go for a bit of neutral. I'm just adding a bit more clarity to the center of the can and then dropping the highlights to compensate. Perfect. So there's those two areas there sorted. We'll do some more later, but for now, we're going to look at the background. So we're going to go for a new layer. And of course, from here, background. Spelt it right in everything. There we go. So get the mask brush out again. Now, this here has got a bit of a blue tint at the top, which I like. Um, but the problem for me is that it's not blue enough. So we're going to go to that. That's too blue. <laughs> if you just try and gently, there we go. And then we're just going to feather it in. Perfect. Again, if we just go to the before and after. So before we got this very overexposed shot, and now we have this here. And this is all just in raw capture. Now, um, I was discussing this beforehand. I always overexpose my frames quite considerably. For some reason, on the Canon 5 DSR, Overexposure is good, underexposure is bad. I'm not entirely sure the reason why for that, but a lot of cameras like the Sony's, they prefer underexposure and then pushing it up in post. So it's, it's a lot of what works best for you. Um, and this is definitely true for capturing raw files. There's always a best way or best method for your particular camera. Um, when I used to shoot um, 5D Mark II in yesteryear, there's always a 160 ISO was actually better so for colors and dynamic range. So there's a lot of, a lot of little tricks to get for out of your camera just to get a little bit more detail or a little bit more image quality. Right, and so I think I've done all I can do to this at the moment in uh, Capture One. One so moment, Scott, oh, another question. Go for the question. So um, when you send your photos to Retoucher, do you send the original file from the camera or do you send the edited version? I send a lot. So... I send the CR2, which is the raw file for my camera usually. Um, with the CR2, I'll send a TIFF, which is made on site. So during the shoot, we do a few adjustments. And whatever's in that, we'll send that as well, which they often work from because we've already gone, this is kind of what we're looking for. Um, and I will send just a quick JPEG preview because sometimes they'll receive it at the phone and want to have a quick look at it. But the, the CR2 is there, including a frame of this as well as a CR2. Um, just as a, if I've done something to the TIFF that makes it difficult for you, you can go back. Um, but generally, they work off a TIFF file. I send it as a single-layered, 16-bit uncompressed TIFF, which the files get quite unruly for, but it, it tends to be the preferred method. All right, then. Let's get this into Photoshop. So right-click, edit in, edit with Adobe Photoshop. So 16-bit, format is TIFF, uncompressed, um, Adobe RGB. We always have respect crop set when we're doing these into Photoshop, because as you've seen, I just cropped all this stuff off. I don't want to spend hours tidying up all of the outside if we're actually going to crop it anyway. It's kind of a waste of work. Now let's just let that load in. Super, there we go, it's loading. Now, for me personally, Photoshop is a bit of a dark art, but there are some things that pretty much anyone can do, especially with the modern version of Photoshop. It is so much more intuitive and user-friendly um, even selecting items nowadays is super easy. But what we want to do here is tidy up the image. So, Scott, another quick question. Oh, yeah, go for the question. Why TIFF and not a PSD? Why TIFF and not a PSD? That's a very good question. Um, is that for delivering it to the client or for moving it into Photoshop? It's out of context. I'm ah. Sure. If delivering it to the retoucher, why TIFF? Um, TIFF because whatever they choose to do to it, TIFF's really universal. Um, and if opening it into Photoshop, it's because if you open up in certain file types into Photoshop and then pull it back again into the editing software, 
there is a compression that takes place going back into the software because PSD is not native to Capture One. Um, and I'm sure there's a more eloquent explanation of that, um, but that, that's my understanding of it in a very, very simple, non-techy person's way. Um, now, in terms of editing here, I live in the clone stamp world. And that's pretty much my editing of choice. You have to bear with me a bit. We've got a bit of lag on the on the screen. There we go. Now, spot healing is brilliant. Like even like this dent in the can here, almost anyone can come in and just quickly scuttle along here until it's as cleared as possible. We need a bit of a softer brush though, don't we? There we go. This is very subtle little changes. And a lot of it is just removing stuff like this one here that stands out, especially when you're trying to hero something. Anything which detracts from the actual image, I just kind of scuff out. Um, so, yep. Interrupt you again. Go for it with another question. Martin said he can see color fringing along the light streaks in the background and elsewhere. Is this a feature of viewing the image on a monitor, or would it be not present, or would it not be present when printed? Ah, if you mean colour fritters, two things I can see which might be what you mean. If you mean by these bits here on the edge of the light streaks, um, that's because they are uh, LED lights, and this is the hot spot in the centre, and as it bleeds off, it gets less exposed. So an LED, generally speaking, say you've got a red LED, rather than it being the whole red um, colour spectrum, it, it's like a very central point of it, so they do, do clip quite easily. And what you're seeing at the edges here is the lack of clipping. Um, whereas this white light in the middle is the blowing out. Do you mean by the colours going down the side of the can, that is the reflection of the actual light band that we swiped in the background? Um, colour fringing is a weird one. So move colour fringing with a click of a button. Um, but it often looks quite bizarre. Now, I used to do that on all of mine, colour fringing, chromatic aberrations, all of that I would remove using the various buttons you get in lens profiles. Um, but I am yet to find a client who's ever noticed that I've done it. Um, and when I've not done it, I'm yet to find a client that's ever said, I can see some colour fringing there, or there's some chromatic aberrations from that lens. Do you think you stopped down too far? Generally speaking, they don't worry about it. Um, I think it's more of a, a marketing thing for lens companies to say, we don't have these issues with our lenses. Um, I mean, you could remove them if you wanted to, but I don't think it takes away from the image. What does bother me, though, is down this side here, and I won't do it on the live call because this would take me ages to get perfect, um, where it's really bright, we're not getting as much reflection, so the left-hand side of the can doesn't look straight. That, to me, is an issue. That would stop this going into my portfolio. Um, and what I would end up doing is taking part of the straight line here with the clone stamp tool and moving it along. Um, but that would probably take me half an hour to do at my current rate of editing. Let's quickly tidy that. The byproduct of this shot, I'm not sure I could even tell you what it is. There's these weird specular bits up here they kind of look like when there's water in the air and light shines through it. But I know there's no water in the air. Um, so I, I don't really understand what's caused them. I assume it's a like a byproduct of the light moving along. So I'm just going to quickly tidy those up because if there's loads of them, I might be into it, but there's like two or three and they kind of, they look like mistakes, um, which is never good. If, if there's gonna be something in there, make it intentional. I see there's one here as well. Maybe I whipped up some dust whilst I was doing this. We'll see, there we go. And then the most important thing is the, is the sort of idiot scan at the end. And this is where you literally go through the image millimeter by millimeter and sort of have a look around and go, right, what's where, what have we captured or failed to capture what dust is like still sat in there, like it's a tiny little black dot just there. Oh, lost it again, bear with me. Sorry, we've got a slight delay on the mouse. There we go. But I can just see a little black dot here. And that dot's tiny, but if you imagine this can printed the size of a human, uh, it suddenly becomes a bit of an issue. 
And a lot of what we're looking for in the corners, especially, is sensor dust. Um, if you go and look around London at any given time at the billboards, you'll find sensor dust in them. And most people won't ever notice it, and the general public won't ever notice it, but you'll forever know that there's sensor dust on your billboard, which is never a, a nice thing. This one here needs to go, but that's going to take a clone stamp unless Photoshop's got so advanced. Should we test it out? If this works, I'll be amazed. Oh, look at that. That was impressive. There we go. Computers really are coming on a lot. There we go. So that, that's good enough, I think, for now. So let's close this down. Press save. And then press OK. It's got no compression. There are the settings we have it on. Press OK. This now comes back into here as a TIFF. Let's wait for it to load. There it is. And this is our now edited TIFF. So we just go back to the previous file. And if we just reset this, there we go. Now, some people would call this fixing it in post, but it's only fixing it in post if you've messed it up in, in capture. I like to call it careful planning. Um, but there's still some changes I want to make. I want more sculpting on the can. So we're going to come back here and just do a quick adjustment. So I'm trying to talk whilst doing something, and normally I just have my tongue sticking out at this point. Uh, but we're just going to... Do a bit of saturation. There we go. And that, apart from adding noise onto it, which is what we do last. Now, we don't sharpen it again, so we've sharpened it already. But we'll add some soft grain in there. Let's bump that up a little bit. Again, this is a point where you can't see it at this level. So we're just going to zoom in. There we go. You see, it just gets rid of that slick digital look. Um, which we spent all that money on. Uh, we'll try to make it look like film again. And from a distance, you see just in these like light here, it's got like fuzziness to it. If that was super slick, it, it just wouldn't look as premium. Um, now, normally I'd go into the calendar a lot more retouching in there, but this is pretty much it. And we know that the colors are accurate. We've not changed the hue of the yellow. It is Schweppes yellow. We've slightly enhanced it with some sculpting and dodging and burning. Um, we've completely changed the colors in the background, but we knew what we were starting with, which makes it much easier. So when we look here, we know that this yellow here will be the same in the Schweppes can. It will be the same yellow, and then it will pick these ones here from its starting point. So it just lets the camera understand where your starting point is, and therefore which one to pick, because there's a limit on how many colors there are per camera. And I'm guessing if you sit somewhere in between two different colors on a Canon, it's probably not going to know which way to go. Um, which is one of the benefits of the sort of more 16-bit medium format cameras. You get a bigger color choice, so you can really like have fine gradation. There's every now and again you do a shot like this where it's all yellow, and it struggles to find enough tones. You'll get some weird banding going on. But today we've been fortunate enough not to have that issue. So that's... I'm going to take my glasses off because they're only for looking up close. That's kind of the setup in terms of color management. So it's capturing perfect reference colors in camera, making sure the screen itself is set up to show you perfect referencing colors. And then from there, you don't have to keep them. You can go whichever way you want. But if you do change them, once the screen's calibrated, you know you're seeing actually what you're getting. And by starting at a neutral point, it, it makes your life a lot easier, and especially in monochromatic images. And by that, I mean when you've got like a red can of Coca-Cola on a red background with a red prop. Um, that sort of thing's a nightmare to try and fix by eye, but with one of these, it just makes life so much easier. So we've got one other question, and it's um, in Lightroom, you have a tra tab of transform that can make your image straight, if you don't know the answer. Do you not have that inside Capture One? Yes, you do. So transform is called keystoning. There we go. So leveling and straightening are two different things. So what this will do is correct for sort of merging and converging. Is that the right word? Converging? Basically, the effect of looking up at a building and it toppling over backwards, it will fix that. But any of these, whether you're going for verticals or horizontals, distort the actual product. So 
one of the reasons I use that big camera with the bellows and the movements is that you can do this in camera without distorting the actual product, whereas this is kind of stretching pixels. Um, so when people say, oh, I'm an architecture photographer, but instead of using a tilt shift lens, we do it like this, their buildings kind of get stretched and the pixels get borrowed and pulled along. Whereas if you use an actual, either a view camera or a tilt shift lens, you can just change that perspective naturally, which gives you a better final image. Um, the, so the, there's kind of, and this is something which is a pet hate of mine, there's a few things in f photographs that have to be level. One is your horizon like this, and one is your fore and aft like this, or your left to right at the back. Um, fixing this one, your horizon, nice and simple. You just kind of twist it and crop it. Fixing the fore and aft or the, the verticals, doing that, you can only do it by stretching pixels, and it always looks like the pixels have been stretched. It's never a good look. So if you're ever going to get a wonky picture, only ever have it going up and down on the horizon. Anything else is not ideal to fixing post. Good. Super. Lovely stuff. Thank you very much. I don't think we've got any other questions at the moment. Um, so, we'll see if anyone throws anything in the chat. Yeah, if you have any questions, do let me know. And so, for those who don't use Capture, another really useful thing is I'm not sure whether Lightroom has caught up and done this since. You can choose your recipes, your export recipes, and you can select like six different ways to export at once. Um, so I'll have my Instagram post, my full-size JPEG, my TIFF, all exporting at the same time of the same file, which just makes life a little bit easier and faster. And then the tether capture is extremely stable, um, which is one of the reasons I moved over. There we go. Yeah, so thank you very much for dropping by for this. I hope it's been of use to you. Um, big thank you to Muse by Lamesca and AccuColor by Ben Q for helping with this workshop and putting it all together for us. And I'll see you all next time.